I guess we should get started. Um, so I'm giving this talk a little bit uh, unprepared, so uh, I will ask for your uh, sort of, uh, uh, how do you say, forgiveness. Um, but anyway, uh, this is this is a talk about the uh, the peer review consortium, and in fact, uh, how we go uh, with what what are we going to do with the peer review consortium? That's that's really more the uh, the talk. And uh, my accomplices and uh, nothing is uh, being supervised by them, so everything is my fault. Uh, are Marianne and David Kennedy, Marianne Martin and David Kennedy. Uh. So uh, you know the problem, uh, the problem of uh, reproducibility that's uh, been like, I don't think this crowd needs to have any reminders uh, on, on this, but uh, this is really uh, why uh, I am personally interested in the, uh, the publishing problem. Uh, that's because of the reproducibility uh, issue in science. And, uh, and the question is whether we can link the reproducibility crisis that we have, especially in the biomedical and uh, bio, uh, bio li the life sciences uh, to the culture of, uh, of publication. I think is uh, probably uh, uh, the answer to that is yes, uh, and there's a very good paper. I don't know if you've seen that uh, on the in the Royal Society uh, on the natural selection of bad science, and that's basically telling us, you know, how uh, you know, like if you uh, if you hack if you uh, do all those back practices of uh, of uh, statistics, then you will be publishing more, and therefore you will be like more successful in science. Uh, as as a very successful person, you know, I, am, uh, I can say that. Um, <laughs> Um, and I do have about 20 minutes, right? I love that quote. I just put that quote, so just for you to remind. The more any quantitative social indicator is used for social decision making, the more subject it will be to corruption pressures, and the more apt it will be to distort and corrupt the social processes it is intended to monitor. Uh, you have to a bit think of it uh, before uh, to absorb it, but it's a, it's a very uh, true statement by a very famous uh, uh, social uh, scientist, Campbell. So one aspect of the uh, the publication, and uh, I'm putting that slide a little bit uh, for the for the future of the talk, uh, is uh, how hard it is to actually communicate with the both the, uh, the journals and the editors. And that paper was uh, explicit about that. You know, they they really try to mend uh, a set of, of uh, errors that they find in the uh, in the world of uh, epidemiology, uh, and they couldn't actually get those errors corrected easily. And that's uh, I think that's a very uh, it it really speaks to the fact that we need to uh, get our networks with the journals uh, uh, tighter and, and more uh, uh, functional. So what's the NPRC and what is the NPRC? It's the Neuroscience Peer Review Consortium. Uh, what are the motivations? Uh, so the journal editors, so that many solid manuscripts were being rejected, uh, either because of space limitations or, uh, you know, like, a, or the article not appropriate or not good enough, uh, other than resubmit and reject, rejected articles to another journal, and then the same reviewers are called upon again. The pool of reviewers are, is actually quite small for some of the work, uh, and then provide the same comments. Uh, so that was um, another motivation that, that therefore it's an extra work for editors, uh, must spend some more time uh, for the soliciting the reviews, affect the quality of the peer review because then you know the best qualified reviewers won't uh, you know, uh, review again, uh, affects authors and readers, publication of research results is delayed by weeks, possibly months, uh, and so on. Uh, so uh, all those are good motivations. So that's the uh, and therefore the uh, the uh, uh, the new science peer review consortium solution was to uh, basically create that consortium and then the and permits the author to whose papers are not accepted uh, by one journal in the consortium to submit their manuscript with uh, another journal uh, to another journal. Uh, with the previous set of reviews, and that's the key thing. You 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 bring the you send the paper to uh, to another journal, and you say, okay, I agree that all the uh, the the other the reviews that have been done already uh, should should be in that in that uh, in that paper. Uh, should be in the, in the journal. So ten years ago, uh, the uh, at the PubMed Plus conference, uh, there's a working group uh, that uh, started that uh, this uh, consortium, uh, and then by the fall of uh, you know, like, uh, let's say early 2008, uh, there was a, a already a bunch of uh, of journals like you know that uh, went with the uh, with the, uh, the initiative. 
And you'll see uh, on this uh, on this uh, that a couple of uh, you know uh, not only journals but also uh, uh, publishers, uh, uh, companies, uh, uh, the NCF, the uh, you know some organization, international organization, and so on. So what's an, uh, it, what's an, in an NPRC? So it's a reduced, reducing time and effort for the uh, for uh, for the peer review aspect. Uh, it's a cross-publisher alliance, which is uh, uh, important. Uh, it's open to any neuroscience journal uh, that is indexed by Medline. So that's uh, also very open, and it has no cost. Well, no cost. Uh, you know, it has some cost actually, but uh, it has little cost of work uh, by the uh, by the editors. So if you go on the on the website and look at uh, uh, nprc.org, uh, you will find like uh, what the information for authors, for information for journals, and what is what it is, and so on, what the history, and uh, and so on. And nowadays there are more than sixty journals that have joined the consortium, which is quite remarkable. Uh, and uh, you know I won't uh, display all of those, but uh, is it is uh, something like a, a big success. And, uh, and I was surprised when I studied this, uh, this little consortium that that was the case. So the benefits, uh, authors can ask for reviews that are forwarded to another uh, journal, okay, for sure, that's a, that's a benefit. Um, journal in the consortium benefit by reducing the workload on reviewers. Uh, reviewers are happy because they see their work being reused, possibly uh, now that we have Pablon and all those things that, that can be like a, uh, you know, another solution for that problem. Um, Speed up the publication process, but is it really important that uh, we speed up the publication? I'm going to put some question mark and so I will get a little bit of a del the, the limitation of that uh, of that initiative. Uh, is it really important that we speed up things now that uh, we try to put all the uh, the work in a preprint archive, uh, or is it not that important anymore? Um, so allowing a better reviewing process is super important. Um, uh, you know, knowing the other reviewer's opinion, that makes makes like a, you know, if I read some other reviews from of, the, of a, a paper that I'm reviewing, I will. So I will. There's some benefit. The benefit is that I will have, a, you know, I, I will have I will be able to think better probably about the work. Uh, we'll get some uh, advice from people that would know better in some aspect of the work and so on. I would also be biased, uh, which is you know possibly a problem if you try. There's already so few. Reviews for one work uh, that uh, you know if you're being biased by the first reviews that's uh, that's that's even worse right so that's another question um, are we going to be too much influenced by the uh, the first uh, those things that we uh, we get in a bit like in the same thing that would be like in the social media or like a platform or you know if you wanted to uh, discuss a work um, uh, openly. So, uh, so it helps to mend the uh, review process that is noisy and slow, um, but uh, it doesn't modify fundamentally the review process. Um, it's sometimes also difficult for journals to implement it because they have to do some manual work of you know, like uh, pushing those reviews, and they, they don't have always uh, the platform that makes it easy for them to actually push the, uh, the reviews to the, uh, to the next journal. So, question is, you know, uh, does it really truly help? It's not, uh, it's not on, entirely true, uh, entirely clear to me. Uh, it is useful, though. So, I'm going to now uh, take, you know, I go to a little uh, turn in my talk and uh, and look at it at where this thing is living. This thing is actually living in the INCF, the International Neuroinformatic Consortium Facility. It does the INCF provide actually the structure, the platform for uh, NPRC? Uh, and it's uh, INCF for those who probably know the, the organization, but for those who don't, so it's a little spin-off from the OCD, um, uh, it re which is really basically trying to get neuroinformatics. Uh, so uh, anything that is on the neuro side, and anything that is helping for the uh, on, uh, uh, in terms of informatics on the neuro side is, is on, in their world. And they recently moved in to make sure that uh, some standards of communication for science in neuroscience are being uh, created and vetted uh, by the organization. And I think that's, that's the key thing here, and I'm, you're going to see our link that with the uh, NPRC. So if you go to their website, you see like uh, they do training, they do uh, conferences, they do, but the main thing that they also uh, fund some little collaborative projects, which is important, uh, especially when you have to design or vet uh, uh, a standard. Uh, but uh, what is important really is that they are uh, they, they, you know, they, they really are a space, international space, which is not a silo lab or institution uh, to create those working groups internationally. 
And that's the network, plenty of uh, countries, uh, uh, not enough that are paying, but you know, plenty of countries, uh, and that's quite good. So uh, they recently moved their mission towards endorsing community standards and best practices. And I think that's a really good thing because I don't see any organization at that time that has the uh, status of uh, an international organization that can do that. Uh, and it's also critical for, uh, for us in terms of scientists for reusing unity for the FAIR principle. If we want to reuse things, you have to have some kind of standard of communication. It could be at the file format level, it could be at the documentation level, it could be at the best practice level. All those things uh, should be as much as we can. And in, in the case it is useful, uh, do, uh, do they uh, uh, being standardized. So they have the, uh, their Council for Training Science and Infrastructure has created like a process for, for doing this. Um, and uh, so you, they would like, a, uh, could endorse uh, an existing uh, uh, standard or best practice, or they would fund a little bit of an extension of one of those standards, or, or they would actually uh, identify a space where, okay, we really need something there that doesn't exist, uh, and then we would fund this little working group to uh, make it happen. Uh, and that's really in the spirit of making those research objects as fair as possible, in the, especially in the terms of the R, given uh, like a, if we you know, think about the previous talk. So what's the relation between NPRC and SVP? Uh, well, if standards are uh, you know, key for communication of research and for efficient research and for reusability of research, possibly interoperability of research, uh, but they are really difficult to build, and they are uh, difficult to agree on. And the, question, the problem is not usually the technical problem. It's usually 80% is the social problem. So uh, because of the way uh, the f uh, research is funded, because of the way uh, we work in academia, it's really, really hard to uh, you know, get in a big group and say, OK, this is what we're going to do to together. So OK, so that's a. Uh, so we need two ways of, like, uh, of, uh, of uh, you know, solving for that problem. Uh, and uh, uh, even funding agencies ha have, are some kind of silos as well, because uh, they need to report to their Congress or you know, to make sure that their money is going to their scientists and, and so on. So, so they're, they're not very great at funding like international in initiatives. Like uh, even the IBI, for instance, the International Brain Initiative, is not very well funded. It's funded by Kavli. Uh, well, it's maybe well funded. It's, it's not funded by the funding agencies of the, the national funding agencies, that's what I meant. So uh, as a first example of a, the, an NNCF vetted uh, standard, there's a bit, the brain imaging uh, data structure. It actually originated from an NNCF workshop um, and then was uh, developed by the, uh, the st by Stanford, by uh, Chris Govgoreski and, um, and Russ Podrak and others. But it's a really community effort. And I think uh, part of it was that the, uh, all those networks of community uh, came because of the, uh, of, uh, the previous work of the uh, organization, that's one. So that's a, a, just a way of you where, how you describe brain imaging and, and there are all the metadata that are associated to those, uh, to those data, uh, which is very useful. And so NCF took that uh, as you know, their first use case. How, how do we vet that standard and to make sure that the, that the standard is actually vetted uh, by an international organization? So there's a process, uh, they, you know, like a, there's a, a long process where they, you know, how to do that and so on and make it uh, as, as good and as uh, transparent and as uh, uh, fair as possible. There's uh, some other standards that are being developed. I'd like uh, to talk about the uh, uh, one that uh, is still a bit lingering, um, uh, which is the Human Atlas Working Group. It's, a, it's a pro the problem of like how do you describe brain atlases and they're everyone has a different way of describing their brain atlases. And because their brain atlases are created like every two minutes, it's going to be a huge problem uh, soon in the, uh, it is already a huge problem. We, uh, there are, you know, we can't actually you know, get an atlas and then say, okay, uh, this is another atlas. Let's visualize those two things together. We, we, there's no way of doing that at the moment, most of the time. And obviously uh, the problem, like, as I said, the, uh, the, the, the question is like, uh, if you don't, if you're not careful, uh, if you like, uh, if you are funded for doing something, then this is the, what hap is happening. Of course, there are like uh, end standards, and you can't. Uh, you have to you put your flag somewhere on the project, and this is, uh, and soon you'll get uh, a 15 standard. Of course, 
so my proposal for uh, and Marianne and, and, and Dev and uh, another proposal for uh, the uh, uh, neuroscience uh, peer review consortium is to actually uh, refactor that consortium and make sure that the uh, the journals a part of that consortium are going to be accepting the f um, to be enforcing in some ways or at, or at least promoting uh, a set of standards that are community community based and community developed. Uh, but also vetted by an international organization such that we know that there are good standards. They, they fulfill a series of conditions of openness, of transparency, of uh, governance, of sustainability. All those things uh, should be uh, in, the, uh, uh, in, the, you know, in the description of the, of the standard. So, and also like uh, making sure that they are actually real used, making sure that they're well documented. All, you know, there's, there's a bunch of conditions for a good standard to be, uh, to be a, a non-safe one, vetted one. Uh, so again, that's not a one lab, one project. It's a, yeah, there's, a very, there's a verification process. And so I uh, think uh, uh, NPRC should really be the, uh, the, the place where those standards are going to, you know, the, the scientific community is, uh, is going to be publishing in, the, in, the, in those set of journals, will be told, hey, you're actually linking to some data. How are the data? described and, uh, and what kind of standard do you, do you use in, uh, in your science for describing those things. That would be a huge incentive. It's, uh, like we know that the, the, the uh, scientific community is like, really focused on publication. We know that's partly a problem. But at least if those publications can you know, embed and have, have the standards of the community in, in, those, uh, in those things, then, then we'll be in a better place. So, uh, so that's the proposal. I think that I could almost stop the, uh, the talk here. I think that'd be fine. Uh, and, think, uh, and we'll be working on that, hopefully uh, both with uh, NPRC and INCF, and, and seeing how much uh, we can ad advance in that, in, that, uh, in that respect. I want to take the uh, example of uh, a couple of examples. Uh, uh, so uh, yeah, coming back to the, uh, you know, like uh, how much of those standards are going to be uh, embedded in those uh, uh, publications, I don't know. It's really like uh, something that has to be discussed uh, you know, across the journals, but also has to be uh, uh, in an like in, in independent way in some ways. We know that the journals do have their uh, financial incentives. Uh, so in a way, it is actually better to have an international organization that says, hey, this is the, the, the standard that you should be uh, you know, promoting and adopting. So yeah, so the problem of uh, communication, how, what, what standards, uh, what uh, the, the language for description uh, is still remaining, but uh, still we would have like a, an independent broker, honest broker to do that. Just a quick slide on the RIDs. Um, the, uh, again, that's a, again an example where uh, RIDs are, are, uh, have been you know, developed again by uh, uh, developed by Marianne uh, Martun and uh, Anita Brunonski and uh, people at UCSD. Uh, they're just like a, for those who don't know uh, the project, they're just a unique, quick, unique identifier that you put in the text of your paper uh, to uh, reference a specific resource, a research resource. So it's been very, very useful for antibodies. Uh, to start with, but uh, it's been also useful for other things. Um, and, uh, and there's b a bunch of, uh, of uh, journals that have already uh, adopted the uh, RDs. So if you have an antibody, or if you have um, a mice line, or if you have like a, uh, a software even, uh, you could reference that research object, that research resource, uh, with a specific identifier, right? And that is extremely useful. Because then you can search for minutes, okay? Then you can search easily, uh, you know, the, the PDF and say, okay, where are those things? And then immediately find them uh, on there and reference them. That's a, that looks like a small progress. It is actually a big progress. I want to do a shameless uh, a plug. Uh, this is a project we're working with the uh, uh, OHBM, uh, uh, the Organization for Human Brain Mapping. It's, uh, it's called Aperture. Uh, it's a, a publication platform that will be uh, embracing, hopefully, all those standards and will be part of the uh, NPRC. And, the, uh, and uh, focusing on reproducibility and openness, and I think the key aspect of that platform, hopefully, will be that uh, not only it publishes PDF, but also other research objects. Uh, one key aspect, I think I've got that in the, uh, the other slide, is that it's non-profit. It's, uh, it, will be, it will have to be high quality. Uh, also, it is 
important to, uh, uh, to see that it, is, it has to be also an open source infrastructure, and I think that's for sustainability aspect and for also the, uh, uh, the uh, aspect of uh, cost. Uh, and then, you know, and then we try to make uh, like uh, the publication of fair research objects as as good as possible. There's a, a lot of discussion at the moment on the what kind of reviewing, editing uh, workflow we need to have. Something that would be possibly hybrid between the traditional uh, expert-based uh, review system versus the community-based, uh, 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 you know, sort of like a. a Discussion and 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 uh, and and, and, uh, and forum aspects, and that's that's something that uh, we need to find the the right balance of, of things, and that's uh, that's a very interesting uh, problem uh, for this uh, for this community. And the funding is coming from CUNP mostly at the moment, and OHPM of course, uh, the Organization for UN Planning. Uh, CUNP is this large. Canadian Open Neuroscience Science Platform that we are working on at McGill. Uh, Alan even is the scientific director. Uh, there's a bunch of uh, uh, people uh, working on that, on the ethical, on the uh, all the uh, the platform aspect, the uh, 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 the training, all those things. CNP is actually par a partnership with uh, Aperture, such that uh, the uh, the uh, actual building of the platform will be done by the uh, uh, under the f with the funding of CNP. And this is a photo of uh, uh, Adam Hyde and the uh, Coco Foundation people, plus a bunch of people at McGill, trying to sort of like uh, design the first uh, plat uh, aspect of the platform. I think I will st stop there. I have a lot, lot of people to acknowledge, uh, and I'm sure I've missed a lot of people in this acknowledgement slide. Thank you very much. Any if anyone questions? has any questions, would you come to the microphone to present? Hi, I, I'm, I'm, I might have missed this, but did you have any problems with review uh, with authors not wanting their reviews passed on? That that happens. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. uh, we did it at PLOS initially, um, yeah. we, just informally, and we got some real pushback, both from uh, uh, an author and from a reviewer, saying. They wouldn't be prepared to pass it on. Yeah, uh, yeah. that uh, that is actually. I don't have the numbers on that, yeah. uh, but that is the case that both uh, authors and reviewers sometimes don't want their uh, their, their reviews to be pa passed on. So how how do you counter that? Because I mean, the rationale we, we was that it would it makes the system unfair because the same bad review goes yeah. <laughs> goes through the system. It's. Uh, I don't think mm. it's an individual journal decision, if I recall correctly. Uh, so I don't think there is any solution except that the journal itself decides what to do with, yeah. with this uh, with this uh, usually they would uh, uh, I, I believe they would just you know send to a, a new reviewers and, uh, and and gone as a normal submission uh, but uh, there's no enforcement I think of the uh, of making sure that the reviews are actually passed and and I don't know whether they should be actually uh, it's, it's unclear to me I, uh, <clears throat> I believe that eLife has this interesting experiment going on where they're going to allow uh, the editors will make a judgment whether there's something um, um, worthy of, of uh, interesting uh, result. Uh, that it'll be reviewed and it'll be up to the, uh, uh, the author to decide whether to ch act on the reviewer's comments. Right. And, and so the, the paper would be published with the reviewer's comments and uh, the author's reason for publishing it anyways. And, you know, as, as opposed to, uh, do you see that as a, as a direction that could be supported in this field? And yes, definitely. I, I mean, uh, I, I do see, the, uh, it's, it's amazing how much the preprint archive system have taken up. If we associate uh, a good forum and a good, uh, sort of like a discussion forum and, 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 and I'm not entirely sure that everything should be on public, but at least you know discussion with the authors. Uh, I think that you know we are we're going to go very long way. We're going to go a long way in that direction. Uh, uh, you know the, the, this, the, the model of uh, of you know do you? I mean I, I do believe the uh, the reviews should be published uh, with the uh, with the article. Uh, whether uh, it happens only if the the paper has been actually vetted and accepted by the journal is a, a question uh, uh, because 
uh, you know, it's, it's sometimes sometimes you know, like uh, reviewers are you know, uh, even the review themselves should be reviewed in some ways. That's what that probably is. Uh, I, I mean, uh, the alternative is just to publish it anyways to, to get it out there to have the, uh, the you know. You mean the reviews or the the reviews and the paper, even though the, both reviewers rejected it. Right. No, it's it's uh, it's a then you know the question is whether the reviewers and the authors would like that. Uh, it's it's uh, you know can you do that without the uh, agreement of both authors and reviewers? Yeah, yeah? <laughs> maybe <laughs> maybe that's the right way. <laughs> uh, it's just like sometimes I mean uh, it, the reviews are very poor uh, as well. No? Uh, so 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 if there's no like a, a general discussion and more like a consensus uh, on 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 what's out there. It can be uh, a little bit, uh, yeah. It's, it, those are those are the details that are difficult to work out. Uh. Um, moving towards more reproducible research adds a lot of burden on the peer reviewers uh, in terms of what they're going to check uh, and what people expect to be verified before things are published. Do you think that reproducibility review is distinct from journal-based peer review? Is there a, a workflow, is there an order in which it should be done? I'm just interested in what you think the community thinks. So do you mean like whether the uh, work should be first vetted as reproducible before being reviewed? Yeah, whether the results can be verified before uh, scope or logic or, or uh, some of the more meta ways of reviewing are added. It's a good point. I, I think... Uh, uh, I think most of the journals would say no to that question because it may be that you know you can't actually relaunch the uh, the, the the workflow and you can't actually re get the results again uh, and and then, but the the actual results is are interesting and the uh, uh, and it doesn't mean that because you can't relaunch those things they're not correct uh, so that's uh, you know they, it, I think, I mean, I, w I would hope that most of the journal uh, start to make a prerequisite that those things are re uh, uh, relaunchable and, 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 and uh, before, before they, uh, like, you know, you, uh, it's a bit like a kind of a prerequisite that you, you have in a paper that you, you need to uh, do all the, uh, the bibliography and you need to, uh, 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 you, have, you can't send anything to, uh, to a journal, right? Uh, so those prerequisites and also like all the, the uh, maybe the ethical statements and all those things are prerequisite for for uh, uh, for publishing. Is reproducibility a prerequisite entirely con like if if reproducibility was simple to define and always achievable? I would say for sure. Uh, the question is that sometimes it depends on the work and sometimes it's actually not. I mean, like, uh, you know, let's say you're using a supercomputer for like uh, two weeks. That's not possible. I mean, you know, nobody can do that. I mean, like, so few people can do that, right? Or let's say, you know, the, let's say you do have, you know, like a limitation for the access of the data, like, you know, uh, and that's that's a fact of life. Uh, and then and then it's it's very hard to reproduce uh, for some reason. So so there's many reasons why not all the works are going to be entirely reproducible. Uh, and I don't think we should prevent uh, the uh, publication and the uh, dissemination of that research work, uh, but we should definitely push uh, for the globally and generally speaking for the uh, for uh, getting the possible aspect uh, being <laughs> checked first. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Thank you. Hi, I, I am Tirthankar from IIT Patna. So I have, uh, so first of all, a very good presentation and a very good kind of work that you are doing. So I have two questions. The first one being that, uh, are you play, um, is the double blind peer review system uh, incorporated in your workflow? And uh, number two is, can you just take the author consent and make the reviews public as a corpus? Yeah, no, I think, uh, I mean, making the review public so uh, I mean, or, uh, I think making the reviews published with the work is sounds to me like uh, having much, much more advantages than disadvantages. I mean, there are a few disadvantages. We talked about that before. But they, they, the advantages of that uh, are overwhelming to me. Uh, and one of them is that the, I mean, I know as myself, as a, as a reviewer, uh, I don't always take all the time that I need to take uh, to review work, right? And, but if I know that my review is going to be uh, published, I will probably make a more effort, take less review uh, to do, and to them better. I think as, as 
generally, you know, generally speaking, I said like a psychological aspect. I mean, you, uh, uh, we should be responsible for what we're writing, and, and responsibility and accountability can be, you know, like through the uh, pushing that with the, uh, with the with the work. It's also an acknowledgement aspect, right? So the first question was whether the uh, the double blind aspect. It's um, uh, it's tricky because I mean, so for instance, uh, I think Nips had this experiment uh, uh, a few years ago where they uh, they did all this uh, very careful double blind, uh, like uh, and actually they, uh, yeah, um, not Nips, sorry, uh, Nips, Nips did the did the experiment for like a like a trying to uh, have a first set of reviewers and a second set of reviewers and fun. And it was a very interesting result. Uh, and I'm demonstrating, I think, largely the noise of the review process. Uh, and, and therefore, the issue of, the, of, of opening up to like, a larger uh, number of reviewers and therefore like a, uh, possibly like a, a forum aspect. Uh, but um, uh, the double blind uh, uh, is hard sometimes because uh, obviously for the, uh, um, we've got Usually, journal have you know like uh, reviews are you know are, are not disclosed and the name of the reviews are not disclosed, but the uh, um, the, uh, the the name of the authors is so very I mean it's like maybe if at least fifty percent of the case even or sometimes more it's it's very easy to to guess who are the authors if you are in that specific field I mean first of all they are citing work that they've did before and all those things like so it's very hard to to blind the uh, the uh, the uh, the name of the authors I would say in general I mean it can happen sometime but you know it's not uh, the general uh, setting. And I will just like to add. Uh, so uh, recently, there was uh, there is a data set of peer reviews uh, re uh, released by Allen Institute of Artificial Intelligence in NACL 2018. And uh, if you go through the paper, you could see that there is a huge contrast in which the reviewers are giving scores and whatever they are writing. So they are writing very good, good, good things, and uh, ultimately the score is boiling down to very less. Mm -hmm. So you could have a take a look. Interesting. Um, if you'd like to continue the discussion offline, if the break and coffee are ready. Thank you. Thank you.